Hello and welcome to For the Quantum Grammar Shoot Podcast, the only podcast of its kind on the internet. I'm your host, colon Jason, hyphen Matthew, colon Glass, you may call me Jason. And today, uh, the topic that I've chosen to expound upon is basically navigating in and out of regular situations and precarious situations and the way everyone chooses to do that. Now I have found through experience and through speaking with many 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 different people that everybody approaches things differently. There is no one correct approach to a situation When I say correct, I don't mean in terms of correct sentence structure. I mean, there is no one way. There is no quote-unquote right way to do it. There's lots of different ways. There are principles that you can observe and apply that will give you a more consistent performance than someone who does not attempt to apply these principles course. And then there are people that are completely principle-less, who are unscrupulous and will do whatever it takes to achieve whatever their goals are. A lot of people think, you know, I've come into contact with all different types. And a lot of people, a number of people, think that it's okay to cheat and lie with the fiction system simply because the fiction system cheats and lies you to you if that makes sense they think it's okay and for them i mean that's their choice the thing is is that if if you're in a confrontation with someone and now that that's a bad example look i'll use the example of of war right you're in war and when you're in war and i've known people i'm not going to say who i know people who have been in the vietnam war i know people who are in desert storm i knew people who were um an 82nd airborne that went over to iraq and They told me that in some cases their commander was given the option where if they gave a command and a soldier refused to obey the command, they could be shot on sight. That was an option because they're putting the whole platoon in jeopardy by not following orders. I had a story told to me by someone who was in the Vietnam War that he and his his group were walking through the woods doing a patrol at dusk and he said he looked up in a you know in the thick foliage in the tree and he saw what was like a 10-year-old boy holding an automatic rifle a Vietnamese and they made eye contact And their orders were to kill the Viet Cong, were to kill them. And he made eye contact with that boy, and he said he just kept walking. They walked under the tree, they walked past the tree, they were gone. Nothing happened. He chose not to kill the boy or engage the boy. That's a choice. And he disobeyed orders because the order were, was to kill the enemy. And they were the enemy. The boy was the enemy. So when you're in war, some uh, war parties will say, you know, use a scorched earth policy. Kill the whole family. Go door to door. Kill the whole family. Kill the children. Kill the women. Kill the men. Kill everybody. Kill the dog. Kill the rats. Kill everything. Kill the cockroaches. Well, no, leave the cockroaches. But other than that, kill everything. 
And then some people think that's wrong, that to kill children is wrong. They don't agree with that, and they won't do that. The long and short of it, the long drawn out point I'm trying to get at is that um, you don't have to do what the other side is doing. Just because they do it doesn't make it okay for you to do it. There's a point with which everyone will not go beyond. You may think you know what it is, but you probably don't. You probably don't know what it is until you actually reach that point. In a now space scenario, then you know, oh, yeah, this is the line that I will not cross, no matter what. Come hell or high water, I will die before I cross this line. Hopefully, you will never be put in that situation. That's where you find out where the line is. You can hypothetically say where it is right now, but you don't know that for sure. You don't know that for sure. So I can guarantee you 9.9 .9 times out of 10, wherever you think the line is right now in your mind, if you were actually pushed and called to the carpet and that line appeared, you'd probably step right over that line and keep going until you actually crashed up against the real line which with, with which you would not go beyond. And then you know, okay, I'm not going beyond that line. This is one method, the method that I use to engage with the fiction system the method i use is based upon three principles position of peace neutrality maintenance of rule one rule equal and the balance of the honor and the grace i basically exhaust all possibilities before going you know full out all out full blast because i know that these people that are the Vassalis in the fiction system. They have mothers and fathers, aunts and uncles, cousins, sisters, brothers, sons, daughters, granddaughters, grandsons, nieces, nephews. They have all these things just like we do. And while a very small percentage of them may actually be malicious and out to do you harm maybe the vast majority of them don't have that volition they're just ensconced in a fiction system they're used to a certain way of doing things they're used to certain rules laws regulations codes statutes whatever they're used to that that's what they're used to following they're not used to be putting in a position where they have to think outside of that and that's why I always say the most important thing is to learn the grammar. Learn correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar. Learn it inside and out like you know the back of your hand so that you know it well enough to teach someone else. There are no doubts in your mind that you can use it and teach it to someone else. Because when you take someone outside of that box that they're used to being in, someone like a Vasily, for example, you have to be able to grab, have their hand and guide them and make them feel assured that you know what it is you're doing. You know what it is you're talking about because you're taking them into strange waters that they've never been in before. Like what I was talking about uh, a few videos back, the nitrogen narcosis, where you're diving and a diver reaches a depth where the water pressure, whatever, is just too much for them to handle, they start acting erratic. And that's what people do when they're putting, put in situations of extreme stress. They do very strange things because it's a similar situation to nitrogen narcosis. You have to be there to be able to grab their hand and take them to a shallower depth so that they can gain their senses back, so that they feel safe again, so they feel assured that at least somebody knows what the hell's going on here, even if it's not them. That's why you have to know the grammar that well. You have to have that level of closure on the grammar in order that someone else feels confident that you know what it is you're doing. Because if you don't know what you're doing and you try to take somebody outside of, of a Vasily outside of what they're used to dealing with, 
they're just going to think you're crazy because they can tell. They can smell it a mile away that you don't know what you're talking about. So then they're going to come at you with something probably like, well, this person is not only a danger to others, but they're a danger to themselves because they don't know what the hell they're talking about. They're spouting gibberish. And then they can take you and lock you up. That's usually how they get in on it. People that don't know what the hell they're talking about. That's why it's so important to have closure on this grammar. The number one important thing. I keep saying it over and over and over. You know, I've been doing live streams. I'm tr trying to teach people through, you know, now time, now space experience. What rule one rule equal is what you put in is what you get out. Um, <clears throat> I just did a live stream where I said I wasn't going to talk until someone asked the question because I wanted to show, to demonstrate, what you put in is what you get out. If you don't ask any questions, there's not going to be any talking and the video is just going to be silent. You're not going to get anything out of it because you haven't put anything into it. I think it kind of fell on deaf ears. I didn't expect it to go all that well because for whatever reason, people, you know, a decent number of people watch the live streams. They just don't participate with them for whatever reason. And I just wonder, you know, how do they ever expect to use this technology if they can't even comment on a live stream, if they can't even step forward and credential themselves? That's why I always say only the 1% of the 1% of the 1% are going to learn this. And if you're listening to this right now, the odds say that you probably aren't one of them. But I do congratulate you for being here, for watching this and listening to this channel, because then again, you may be one of them if uh, you decide to learn this stuff. But you have to have a reason to do it. So to get back to what I was originally talking about, the different types of personalities and different sectors that people come to me from uh, that want to learn this grammar... I've mentioned before that I've had some common law people uh, come up to me and want to learn that they've been doing common law or common law for 10 to 15 years. Um, one guy even mailed himself up into the judges' chambers using adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun, fiction, babble, but using common law. But that's still he still wasn't having the success that he thought he should be having, and common law wasn't solving the increasingly more problematic issues he was having. So he came to me to learn correct sentence structure. Unfortunately, in that instance, uh, from my perception, that individual, who is not a bad man or anything, he's actually a, a really good guy. Um, but he would not let go of his the, the common law type of, how can I say it? The, the things he learned from common law, he thought took jurisdiction over correct sentence structure when the actual opposite is true. And the main issue was he did not want to use the one by 1.9 flag, which he doesn't under, he didn't, I guess, understand he couldn't understand or else he would have used the flag. He didn't understand that that grammar flag is part and parcel of being successful using this grammar. The 1 by 1.9 grammar flag is the flag of the land during the time of the contract. That's how you take jurisdiction over the well of the court, if you know those mechanics. It is not the past tense United States flag. It is the correct sentence structure, communication, parsley, syntax, grammar flag. And it is necessary and critical to use that in conjunction with postal mechanics and banking mechanics, grammar mechanics, in order to be completely successful with this grammar. But he didn't want to use it because of some archaic adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun, common law rhetoric. And so... I had to break bulk with him because I was teaching him 
we were doing classes and I said, you know, I have to, for the safety of yourself and your construct, I am not going to be responsible for you getting in trouble or, have, you know, creating shipwrecks because you're not using all the mechanics, the safety mechanisms. It would be like teaching someone how to use a firearm. And then they all of a sudden, you know, after you've done a few classes with them, they all of a sudden say, I'm not going to use the safety. They say, I'm not using it. Nope. Not going to use it. Not going to put it on ever, ever, ever. Because I don't believe in it. Because it makes me feel this kind of way. Well, well, what else can you do? I mean, it's their choice. But it kind of, it makes things very, very dangerous. It's the same thing. If you don't use all the mechanics that are necessary and available, then you could wind up in a lot of trouble. And I'm definitely not going to be part and parcel to that. And besides that fact, he did not have closure on the grammar yet when we stopped, when I broke bulk with him. There was another fellow um, that I don't know what happened to him. He just stopped communicating with me. I'm not going to say his name, uh, but he was very big on the common law and stuff like that. And he was a part of something called an environmental court. But when you think about it, you know, environmental, that's a vowel in front of a consonant. That's no contract as far as correct sentence structure goes. Uh, but he did not know the grammar. And he, he began trying to tell me that, you know, David purposely led people astray and blah, 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 blah. It's like, how do you know that? And we talked on the phone one day. And <laughs> I kept saying, you're giving jurisdiction to your words and, what, and what's going on to a fiction styles manual. Do you understand that? It's a fiction styles manual. He was talking about the underline or something like that. And once that got through to him, he all of a sudden stopped talking. And then we started talking about something else because he knew what I was saying made sense. That, yes, you can use fiction styles manuals, fiction etymology dictionaries and things like that to certify your continuance of the evidence for the meanings you give your words and your symbols and your hieroglyphs and your documents. But at no point do you ever give jurisdiction to those things over your documents. You give jurisdiction to yourself over those documents by creating your own finite means, your own styles manual. Using fiction styles manuals and fiction dictionaries and fiction etymology dictionaries to certify those things as continuance of the evidence, cross-referencing and so forth. But you never give them jurisdiction over you. And I don't think he was quite ready to accept that. And so he just stopped talking to me after that. Many, many different people. There's a lot of people that go over to that, uh, what you call that place, that You Are Law website. I know a lot of work went into that website. I don't know if it's still up and running or what have you. But I also know that they don't use correct sentence structure. They don't use correct grammar. I've seen their syntax video. Matter of fact, I did a reaction video to their syntax video. And it's not syntax, it's par se. They don't even know what syntax is. <clears throat> they confuse syntax with par se, which tells me that they come from someone, whether it's the leader of the website or not, I don't know who, someone was a Mark Lowercase K. Kishon Christopher student because Mark does the same thing. Mark doesn't know how to syntax, he doesn't know how to use correct sentence structure, but he knows how to par se. And he sort of sells par se as being the whole ball of wax when actually it's only one third of the ball of wax. And that UR Law website uses that same concept. I don't know if anyone's had successes on that website. I know that one time I went through the website and was looking at testimonials. But of course, no one ever uses their full name. No one gives any contact information. So for all I know, they're all fake. 
when I see someone using a nom de guerre, they only use their first name and they don't give any contact information, yet they're testifying to something. It has no credibility. It has no weight to it. Unless you use your correct name, unless you give a place to contact you, you you're not you have no credibility in my eyes. Like you see me on the internet, I use my correct name. I give an email address for you to contact me. You can actually contact me. I will talk to you. That is a continuance of the evidence. If someone's out here just babbling on about something and they don't use their correct name, they don't use their real name, they don't have any way of contacting them, then it's just BS. Even more so is that QAnon stuff. It's all anonymous. Well, we know someone who has high level of security clearance and they told us that blah, blah, blah. Who cares? You can't prove any of it. And then someone could say, well, they said this and it came true. Well, yeah, stopped clock is right twice a day too. You can keep throwing out predictions and, and, and gossip just like splattering poop on a wall. Some of it's going to stick. But most of us just going to splatter down on the ground. And it's not going to mean anything. At least not to someone like me. That's why, you know, I have the same position about religion and things like that. This is what correct sentence structure has led me to. You know, it's really ironed out my thinking. Really distilled my thinking down to super hyper-logical um, I participate with facts as facts, and if I can't certify something as a fact, it's an opinion. It's an assumption, it's a presumption, it's a guess. Now, there's lots of that. And contrary to popular belief, it does not take the mystery out of life. There's plenty of stuff that I can't explain. For example, you know, a man and a woman get together and they consummate a child. They conceive um, an embryo. You know, the woman carries that embryo. Uh, what do they call that? The zygote, then the embryo, and blah, 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 blah. And then she gives birth to the baby. Did they make that baby? I don't think so. They contributed to it. Yeah, sure, they contributed to it. But if you if the woman was, was let's say, for example, the woman was in the garage building an engine from parts. She's like, well, you know, I want the car to go really fast, so I'm going to give it this kind of transmission. I'm going to give it this many horsepower. Um, so on and so forth. I want it to be a manual transmission. You know, and then, then they design the body and everything. It's going to be the color red. and So you can piece by piece create a car, a vehicle. To, to your specifications, it's going to look the way you want it to look. It's going to sound the way you want it to sound. It's going to go as fast as you want it to go. You can do that. But that's not what happens when a woman gets pregnant. She does not say, well, you know, I want the baby to have uh, green eyes. I want the baby to have uh, dark brown hair. Let's see. I want the baby to have sort of a, a longish nose, maybe some small ears, a little bit of a cleft in the chin maybe some lower cheekbones. And when the baby gets older, I, I want the baby to uh, to not really be able to grow a full beard, but maybe have sideburns. And you get my point? She can't do that. There's no way to do that. Something happens while the baby is inside the womb Something's going on there that she's not really conscious of. She's just a carrier. 
She's a vessel for the vessel. Something else is creating that baby. She facilitates, she helped to facilitate it, just as the father did. But she, she's not creating it. Something else is. And I don't know what that is. But I'm okay with that. I'm okay with not knowing. I don't have to, because I can't explain something, I don't have to say, well, oh, it's God. I don't have to do that. Why would I do that? To me, someone who can't explain something, and, and, and then they say, well, you know, it's, it's God's plan. Who can explain it? That, to me, is someone who just chooses to stop thinking. It's just an easy explanation. Well, it's God. Yep. Yeah. Or if something, you know, uh, conversely, if something bad happens, they say, well, the devil did it. It's Satan. It's just a way, you know, to me, it's intellectual laziness. It's the only way I can put it. You just want to stop thinking, so you just say something like that. Attribute it to something else that you can't explain. It's something, first of all, that you can't explain, so you decide to attribute it to something else that you can't explain. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. <laughs> but correct sentence structure has given me the tools to be okay with not knowing something. I'm okay with it. Is it important to my, to my everyday life to know that? No, it's not. So I concentrate on the things that are important to my everyday life and getting through it and stopping trespass if I need to and teaching other people the few, very, very few people who really want to learn this grammar and really buckle down and want to commit to it, I concentrate on those people. I invest my now space in those people um, rather than spread myself thin over what the shape of the earth is, whether space exists or not, whether there's a god or not, uh, the devil, whether there's aliens or whether there's... <clears throat> Whatever. Deep underground bases. It's all fun stuff to talk about and speculate about for sure. There's no doubt about it. Um, but the majority, the bulk of my now space, the bulk of my energy, I choose not to participate with that kind of stuff. I choose to participate with more tangible things. And that, that's what I did when I was first learning this stuff. Um, I totally stopped watching conspiracy videos and things like that and only concentrated on watching David Wynn Miller videos and listening to lectures on MP3 while I was doing other things all day long, repeatedly, over and over and over again. That's all I did. I was pretty... Uh, pretty fanatical about it actually because I knew that I wanted to learn it and I wanted to learn it as fast as I possibly could but it took a lot longer than I thought it would for sure it was a lot more involved than I thought it would be so anyways as usual I got off track there are many different ways to deal with things but if you're going to use correct sentence structure, communication, parsi, syntax, grammar, there is a roadmap. There is a roadmap, a successful one, that is consistently successful, and that I have taught to a handful of students who have went out and actually used this stuff and had success with it in foreign vessels and dry dock and, and places like that, also through their own postal courts. And it's based upon those principles that I was talking about. The position of peace and neutrality, maintenance of rule, one rule equal, balance of the honor and the grace. Those three. If you can walk into a situation, maintain your cool, don't get mad, don't get angry. Because if you do, if you get angry, that is a weakness to the fiction system. They will see that, and then they could see you as a threat. And then they can say, well, you're a threat to yourself and others. Again, same thing that I was talking about earlier. If they can get you mad, then they got you, just like uh, John Lennon said. 
So you got to keep your cool. Be a steward of your breathing. Be a steward of your, be a master of your cadence, of the way you're speaking. Never let them see you sweat. No matter what's going on. Because they will try to come at you from every different angle. Use every possible trick in the book to trap you up and make you stumble. Make you stumble from your position. Get you to budge just a little bit. Fear is a huge weapon. If they can get you afraid or angry, then they got you. There's no doubt about it. Then they got you. That's why I always say, you know, I'm a steward. I'm not an owner. I don't own anything. I'm a steward. Because once you own something, you're attached to it. Once you own something, something can now be taken from you. Um, <laughs> as silly as it sounds, it's true. Oh, it's damn true. So if you're a steward, just like, you know, my body, my vessel, I did not create it. I do not own it. I am a steward of it. I take care of it. I navigate with it. I use it, but I am not the owner of it. I am not the owner of this life, so therefore my life cannot be taken from me. So, think about that for a minute. It's like people get very possessive about the people around them. You know, everybody says, well, my kids do this or my child does that. Think about it. So if you're saying it's your child, then that means you possess it. You own the child. Isn't that kind of repugnant when you put it that way? You can be a steward of the child, and it doesn't, or, or a guardian, steward and guardian of the child. That still holds the same weight. It just doesn't sound as weird as owning a child. Like I used to say, you know, when you go to these uh, animal rescue places for dogs and cats and whatnot, and you go through the adoption process and you buy an animal, a cat or a dog or a bird or whatever it is, you're buying them because you own them and you get ownership papers. It's the same thing with an adoption agency for children. You are buying a child. Adoption agencies are basically human trafficking facilities. You have to pay adoption fees. Yeah. You get to pick which one you want, just like a dog or a cat. Doesn't that sound repugnant? See, uh, Children and Youth Services or Child Protective Services is another human trafficking uh, organization. I don't know if I'm going to, if YouTube's going to dock me for this or anything, but that's what it is. What, what does human trafficking mean? It means moving human beings from point A to point B, from one owner to another owner. Someone's selling them and they're going from point A to point B, from one owner to another owner. Isn't that what CPS does? They will remove a child from one owner, from one home, and take them and give them to another owner in another home, or put them up for adoption and someone pays to get them, and now they have a new owner. Am I right or am I right? Is that how it works? I think that's how it works. I'm just using different language to describe it. Now, there can be positives involved, and, and adoption has saved many a child and given them a great life. What I'm doing is putting it bluntly, the facts right in front of you, of what it actually literally is, and I'm trying to give you a sense of ownership versus stewardship. It's a subtle psychological difference, but it's all the difference in the world. For sure it is. It's all the difference in the world. That's like the difference between charging a fee and accepting donations and gifts. It's a subtle psychological difference. There are no charges or fees for what I do. I accept donations and gifts. Psychological difference. 
I don't own anything. I am a steward of things. Subtle psychological difference. Once you can comprehend these types of things and cognize them and let them permeate your psyche, your formatory apparatus, I think that you will find things in your life taking a turn for the better with more positive performance. But again, friends and neighbors, it all starts with learning correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, which is the whole reason why I'm here to teach it with the over 600 videos on my YouTube channel. You can study those all you want to. They're all free. What you put in is what you put out. So if you study for thousands of hours, um, considering I put thousands and thousands of hours into creating them and publishing them and editing them, then what you put in, you will get out. Or, or you can contact me at the email address at the bottom of your screen and apply for a correct grammar workshop. But that's only for the most serious people who really actually do literally want to learn it. Those are the ones that will actually have the intestinal fortitude to step forward and follow through and commit to learning it. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, contact me at the email address listed at the bottom of your screen. I will set up a 10 to 15 minute video consultation between you and me. You can ask me whatever you like and I'll do the same and we'll see if this is something that uh, you're prepared to commit to. If you'd like to support the channel, click on the join button underneath this video. There are two tiers of membership. Uh, the second tier has access to exclusive content not available to the public. Once again, thank you for watching. Uh, hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. Turn the notification bell to all so that you don't miss any of my premieres because I do post on a very consistent basis. There are over 500 correct sentence structure videos for here you to study on this channel. My gift to you, my fellow mankind. Thank you again, and I'll see you in the next one.